And good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Advanced Aviation Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Gary Kolb. Uh, it's good to see everyone in person. Uh, this will be the first in-person meeting we've had in over a year. Uh, in addition to the uh, in-person aspect of it, we also have the capability of uh, this will be the first hybrid meeting that we've had of the uh, Advanced Aviation Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, meaning that those that uh, have been unable to join us, uh, they're participating virtually, as you can see on the screen. So again, welcome to everyone that's participating and attending virtually. Um, we have a full agenda, uh, and but I have a few housekeeping items that I want to get to uh, first. Uh, we are live streaming this event, and it will be archived on the FAA's YouTube channel uh, after the uh, uh, ap after everything is completed. Um, there is a break room uh, just around the corner. If you uh, had an opportunity to get some uh, complimentary drinks and some morning snacks, uh, you were uh, able to do that. Uh, when you checked in, you should have received a um, uh, digital card and that's for your meal here. And um, we will uh, uh, direct you to the uh, lunchroom location uh, when we break for lunch. Uh, if anyone didn't get that, we'll make sure to have it um, available to you as we leave the uh, room. Uh, for the virtual people, <clears throat> uh, as we do the briefings and the uh, chat and discussion, uh, I'll be monitoring the Zoom chat. Uh, and again, just as previous meetings, uh, raise your hand. I'll call on you for those that are uh, attending virtually. Uh, for the briefers in the room, uh, we ask that you uh, just uh, uh, say next slide, and then we'll uh, advance the uh, charts um, as we go through the briefings. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our designated federal officer, Jay Merkel, to uh, begin the meeting. Jay? Good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining us. And thank you, Captain Mills, again, for being our chairman. Uh, if you could do next slide, and I will read the official statement. So in accordance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the advisory committee meeting is open to the public. Notice of the meeting was published in the Federal Register on June 8, 2022. Members of the public may address the committee with prior approval of the chair. This should be arranged in advance. Only uh, appointed members of the advisory committee may vote on any matter that is brought to a vote by the chair. The public may present written material to the Advanced Aviation Advisory Committee at any time. And with that, that's the end of our official statement. On to a review of the agenda. So uh, today we will um, have the review and the approval of the previous meeting minutes. Um, a few very, very brief opening remarks from me, uh, opening remarks from our chair, Captain Houston Mills, then the FAA response to task group 12, integrating UAS operations into K through 12 curriculums. Um, we will have an FAA advanced air mobility infrastructure update. Uh, the, the committee will present their uh, recommendations on the strategic framework for advanced air mobility near-term operations. And these are interim recommendations. We will then take a lunch break and we will um, have, as we when we return from the lunch break, we will get remarks from our deputy administrator, Mr. Brad Mims. We will then have a program update from Mr. Robert Pierce from NASA, and then we will move on to new business and future agenda topics, and then we'll have closing remarks from myself and from Captain Mills, and then uh, Captain Mills, you get to adjourn us. So, excellent. Um, so, I'd like to present the meeting minutes and ask for a motion. So moved. Do we have a second? Do we have any objections? Okay, the motion has passed. The meeting minutes have, its, have been accepted. I will move on to my brief remarks. I. Um, I'm very grateful that we are now all together, or at least most of us are together. And um, thanks to the team, uh, especially the team in our communication staff and the team in uh, my office, 
pulling together this hybrid meeting was a lot of logistics and uh, they did a great job and they worked as a great team together. So I thank them. Um, and with that, I really just want to thank you. I look forward to our, our meeting today and I want to turn it over to you, Houston. Great. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, welcome uh, to those in the hybrid meeting as well. And, and Echo and Jay, uh, appreciation to you and your team uh, for really bringing this together. You know, uh, participating virtually is pretty easy, right? You just zoom in or micro teams in, but uh, con coordinating, you know, a hybrid environment takes a lot more work. And we know, Jay, the, the amount of work in your team put together to bring this, uh, pull this off. We just want to say thank you uh, to each of you. Uh, and then for those of you that are on uh, hybrid, you know, thank you all for being here. We understand that you would rather be here in person, uh, but circumstances kept you far, but uh, we know you're here with us and certainly appreciate your engagement. And for those of you here, it's great to see you. You know, it's great to see smiling faces without masks. I mean, what a, what a wonderful time, uh, you know, just to get together, right? Uh, these, these are the stakeholders and the thought leaders, you know, they're really tasked with some monumental, you know, opportunities to help influence you know, the future of this, this great industry. So I just want to say, you know, welcome. Uh, also, thanks to the, those of you who were able to join us for a reception. We told a lot of fish stories and, uh, you know, drank a little bourbon, uh, which was good, uh, but uh, certainly good just to uh, connect from that perspective. So I uh, just, uh, you know, as we continue, uh, you know, with the uh, work of AAAC, um, it's really a great example of how the, uh, we brought the drone and AAM, you know, communities together. This is our second meeting, you know, with our new charter. And uh, as we continue to work together, I think we'll continue to look for opportunities to really you know, work on the FAs, uh, to provide the FA uh, recommendations on how we can integrate this. To give you an idea of the importance of the, the work that we do as of June 21st of 2022, more than 537,000 recreational model and US owners were registered, over half a million. Over the next five years, by 2026, uh, the sector is likely to have up to 1.84 million undertaking recreational activities. Um, around 316 Part 107 commercial UAS were registered as of June 21st. So those 107 uh, you know, certificates continue to grow. Uh, this number is likely to grow as high as 968,000 uh, by 2026. There are presently 284,256 remote pilots, Part 107 and Part uh, 61 combined. Uh, this is projected to increase by 300, over 361,000 by 2026, creating an additional 700, or excuse me, 76,972 new opportunities. Uh, this projected growth means that drones and AAM will continue to have an even larger role in the overall transportation infrastructure. Uh, part of that work, uh, part of the work of this committee uh, will be that to really bring communities together to partner with the legacy systems and really build that, that, that level of trust within the communities. I, so go back to 2016, I'm always reminded of Michael worked to, you know, early on saying that the key to our success would be public acceptance. And so as we continue to share stories for good, you know, and looking out for public safety and security, and that's really the roadmap for full integration at that point. And I think everyone on this committee understands that. Uh, we understand the pace. It's not always as quick as we would want it to be, uh, but we want this to be a sustainable you know, industry. Uh, so we have to continue to do that. So this type of collaboration and sharing of information and data will only help in accelerating and developing a safe, high volume drone and AEM operations in the near future. Uh, we certainly uh, will uh, pre appreciate the Robert Pierce taking time to join us today. I know in past meetings we said, hey, there's a lot of others working in this space. How do we bring others to share information so we can continue to make sure we're aligned across the board? So having NASA, you know, participate here and share some of those insights certainly, you know, is along that line. I also want to do uh, say thank you uh, for all of you who provided a, a host of you know thoughts uh, in terms of uh, potential uh, future agenda items, future taskings, etc. We won't be able to get to all those because you know as as predicted, uh, you all have some wonderful ideas. You know we'll talk about a few of those in the new business section. Uh, but I did consolidate a list of things that Jay, I'll forward to you just so we continue to uh, to tap on those things, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to make sure you know we're engaging all the stakeholders to move things forward. Uh, so with that. Uh, you know, thank you all for being here. Looking forward to a, a great meeting. I'd like to introduce the first briefer, Abby Smith, Deputy Executive Director of U.S. Integration Office, who will provide the FA's intern response to Task Force 12. And again, uh, just, uh, you know, for uh, Bryant and you and Dr. Shu, you know, phenomenal work by you and the committee uh, that really get us to this point. And so looking forward to a great meeting. So, Abby. Well, thank you very much, Houston. Um, hi, everybody. For those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Abby. 
If you're calling me Abigail, I'm assuming that I've done something wrong. So um, I'm Abby Smith, the Deputy Executive Director for the FAA's US, UAS Integration Office. I'm really excited to be here for my first AAAC meeting in, in this capacity. It was just about a year ago when the committee was tasked to develop recommendations on incorporating drone and AAM operations into K through 12 curriculums. This task was accepted by task group 12, which was led by co-chairs, Dr. Paul Shu, president of the Shu Educational Foundation, and Mr. Brian Wynn, president of the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International, AUVSI. We received the task group's final response in February of this year, and we'd really like to thank all the members and the incredible co-chairs for your hard work on it. Of course, thanks goes to Captain Mills for your overall leadership in the AAAC. The recommendations the task group provided were very thoughtful and thorough and have given the FAA lots to consider. I was especially blown away by the AAAC's finding on the number of drone technicians and pilots needed to enter the US workforce in the next few years. Are you ready for these numbers? By 2023, we'll need 85,000 new workers. That's 2.3% of that year's entire graduating high school class. So if you look on the slide, there's additional number. Oh, sorry about that, Tanisha. Um, Kamisha. So, um, it, there's more numbers on there, but this number is going to continue to grow, folks, and we've got a real situation on our hands. Okay, back on track. Um, the task group recommendations focused on three main areas. First, making educational content and resources readily accessible. Secondly, building connections for action and cultural transformation. And third, delivering aviation-specific curriculums. We agree that these are all important priorities and we intend to dedicate resources to each. As we move forward, we will continue to work with all of you to ensure that we're prioritizing to meet the needs of stakeholders, particularly the future workforce in the best order possible. As you know, safety is our North Star. We're committed to integrating user technologies into our system safely and efficiently and efficiently. We'll work for the American public, especially our stakeholders, and our success depends on the respect, diversity, collaboration, and commitment of our workforce. I do want to let you know that we've formed two additional federal advisory committees as the FAA's Reauthorization Act of 2018 required. They are the Women in Aviation Advisory Board, and the Youth Access to American Jobs in Aviation Task Force. These federal advisory committees are also considering similar questions around expanding access to aerospace careers for diverse and well-qualified individuals. We intend to use their findings, as well as the findings of the AAAC, to develop a comprehensive plan of action. Before we provide the committee with our response to the task group's recommendation, I'd like to point you to a, hot, a list highlighting some of the FAA's most recent and current activities related to STEM outreach. Happily, these existing STEM-related activities already support the spirit of the AAAC recommendations made by task group 12. Please feel free to review the list at your convenience. I'm not gonna read it. And we're always uh, available to answer any questions or offer uh, more information if you need it. So focus area one, make content and resources readily available. Moving on to the recommendations for making content and resources ready available, toward that end, the task group's first recommendation was that we expand access to resources for teachers and students. The FAA is committed to making resources both available and accessible. We agree that it is important to leverage our existing programs, such as the Workforce Development Grant Programs for Aviation Maintenance and Pilots, the Aviation Career Education Academy, and the Drone Safety Day, and we appreciate the AAAC's recognition of those existing resources and tools. To give you a taste of how the Workforce Development Grant Programs are operating, 
I want to mention that the FY20 aircraft pilot grants were awarded to four CTI schools to assist high schools in enhancing their curricula to help students take the Part 107 test and to explore practical applications in the UAS field. One grant recipient, the CTI program at the University of North Dakota, or UND, has reported hosting a couple of highly effective events to date. Their grant reaches into five regions, multi-states, and also extends into reservations for the career and technical education programs at the high school level. Teachers that attended the UND event in, South, in North Dakota were delighted with the resources that are being provided, and especially that the university will not leave them high and dry. Another grant recipient, Elizabeth State University, just finished their first week-long summer, quote, Aerospace Aviation and Drone Exploration Academy, and will be closing the second academy event this Friday. They've had a year-round cohort of 80 students who will begin in fall of 22. The cohort consists of rising junior and senior high school students who will be taking college courses to prepare for private pilot ground and part 107 certification. We're especially happy that ECSU was awarded a grant as one of two historically black colleges and universities um, that currently participate in the CTI program. There are of course, a number of other existing programs, but I wanted to assure you that we will also continue dedicating resources to providing additional materials for educators as needed. On recommendation two, we know that mentors and volunteers are key to helping inspire future generations of aviation workers. We already have a number of FAA employee outreach representatives through our STEM AVSED program and our FAAST or FAST Drone Pros program has volunteers across the US. We wanna build that program even further, but this is just a beginning. We're committed to building on this foundation and creating a formalized network to inspire students and help grow the drone and AAM communities. In recommendation, in, in recommendation three, task group 12 proposed that the FAA collect a number of national and state and regional resources and use them to build an online repository for use by educators. We appreciate the task group taking the time to gather and share these resources with us and the drone community. We all benefit from shared information, which is why we'll continue to provide links to a number of information re informational resources when available and continue to grow the resources and curriculum available to ed educators participating in our UAS Collegiate Training Initiative program. We're committed to getting this information and other resources to educators from K to postdoctoral across the country. The focus area two was around building connections for action and cultural transformation. Turning to the second focus area, task group 12's fourth recommendation calls for the use of public private partnerships to encourage industry participation in K through 12 education. The FAA couldn't be happier to receive this recommendation since we know that the only way to meet future workforce needs is to work together and to make certain that students are exposed to aviation related information early and often. The FAA already has experience with the benefits of public private partnerships and the STEM aviation and space education or STEM AFSED because we love our acronyms, um, program currently has 14 such participants at the national level. Additionally, currently 90 schools participate in our UAS CTI program, and that number continues to grow. And we need to expand it. We want to work with all of you to help us build resources that will teach the aviation professionals of tomorrow. Industry can bring a unique perspective and a variety of resources to the table. And that can only mean good things for all of us, most especially the future workforce. Some of you may already know that addressing gender bias in STEM fields is a cause I'm passionate about. The FAA and our UAS integration office in particular have adopted this cause recently 
with both energy and thoughtfulness. Of course, we owe a lot of that enthusiasm to the AAAC's Task Group 10, which provided important recommendations on eliminating gendered language in the drone and AAM spheres. We've made progress, but we have more to do. I'm comfortable, however, saying that the FAA is already committed to addressing gender bias in STEM fields, not just in terms of gendered language, but in other areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I'm excited to see how much we can do to make anyone who's interested and confident that there is a place in aerospace community for them. You know, I'm very proud of our UAS CTI program. And I was happy to see that task, the task group recognizes its potential to help transform aviation culture. As I mentioned, I do believe it's important to reach kids at an early age with exposure to aviation careers and information. I also know, however, that the college level is often the first chance for students to fully develop their interest more completely. We need to make sure that they can join robust programs when they arrive. The CTA program is growing all the time and we pledge to continue to dedicate resources to the program so that we can grow in terms, not just of breadth, but depth as well. Recommendation seven concerns the FAA forming an interagency working group with the Department of Education and Industry. There are several interagency groups Working groups focus broadly on STEM and it's likely that this recommendation can be addressed in an already existing forum. Nevertheless, we will consider how we can broaden collaboration across the federal government and also how we can continue to engage with state, local, tribal, and territorial governments to help train tomorrow's aerospace professionals with the needs of industry in mind. Again, the FAA is aware that we must all work together to meet the challenge of cultural trans transformation in the aviation arena. So let's talk about focus area three, deliver aviation specific curricula. With recommendation number eight, the task group was interested to see the FAA acknowledge and promote National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST standards to allow for qualitative evaluation of systems capabilities and remote pilot competency. To respond, I'll mention that the FAA is in the practice of collaborating with NIST and other standards bodies on these relevant issues, and that we'll continue to do so. I should also mention that within the context of FAA NIST drone research collaboration, we are aware of NIST's efforts to develop and test remote pilot proficiency standards. Task Group 12's ninth recommendation is to create grade eight through 12 aviation specific STEM curricula modeled on CTE CyberNet. CTE CyberNet is a Department of Education program that works to increase the number of career and technical education teachers who can effectively prepare students for cybersecurity education and careers. The FAA is aware of other organizations such as the Department of Education with existing curricula and initiatives that may be useful as models or otherwise in carrying out the goals of this recommendation. We also understand that successfully meeting future workforce requirements will mean working with others to put more resources into the hands of educators, and we're committed to doing so. For example, we're currently working with our Know Before You Fly partners to make drone kits, including lesson plans, available for school and organizational use. We look forward to additional opportunities to offer such resources to those teaching drone and AAM principles to students. I've talked previously about the FAA's understanding that we will need to dedicate additional resources to K through 12 aviation specific STEM needs. We will work to make appropriate additional resources available and accessible. We are again committing to putting these resources in the hands of educators who are best positioned to maximize their impact. So in conclusion, I wanna thank Task Group 12 for their thoughtful response to this tasking. We really appreciate the recommendations you've provided and the resources you've highlighted. 
At the FAA, we're keenly aware of the imperative to ramp up our efforts to meet future aviation workforce needs. We've already started the process and we continue to actively plan future efforts. Going forward, we will use the task group recommendations to inform our approach. We're also aware that none of our efforts will achieve maximum results unless we put resources into the hands of educators and unless we work with all available stakeholder groups. We thank the members of the AAAC for your enthusiasm towards that end. If you'd like to review the FA's written response to the task group club recommendations, you can find it in the ebook from this meeting. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present our response to this ta tasking, and I'm open for questions or comments. Yes, Dr. Shu. Thank you, Chair Mayo. Uh, I, on behalf of uh, TG12, I just want to thank FAA uh, for for your your uh, your effort to to reply, respond to our recommendation. Uh, and uh, I want to thank our my my co-star uh, co co-chair uh, Brian Wynn and all my colleagues. Uh, it was a uh, it was an eight month effort, <laughs> and uh, so we we're so glad we did it. Uh, just a uh, just a couple of comment and a couple of uh, uh, recommendation for for FAA uh, to consider uh, very quickly on the um, on recommendation number one. I, I, we've, I feel like uh, maybe there's a, there's a, some sort of a dashboard for the FAA to help the, uh, the rural law school teachers when they want to have some resources available, they can go to one site, kind of a, you know, one billet button to push. And I think that'd probably be easier. Uh, recommendation number three, uh, yes, the uh, U, uh, UAS T, uh, CTI is important, uh, but also, the, you know, not just the college level, but also the uh, K-12, I think it's also very important. Uh, recommendation number four, uh, the, the, the PPP, Public-Private Partnership, the, the true essence of this thing is, uh, is for, for FAA to provide any kind of uh, incentives um, you know, to the private companies. And, and so if they have the best practice, whatever, and the FAA might be able to, you know, to, uh, to provide any kind of a, a benefit or something, you know, uh, because that's the, the true essence of a public-private partnership because everybody wins. It's, it's, it's not just a win-win, it's a win-win-win. If it's something, you know, we do like K-12, to it could be multiple wins. So that's that's the one recommendation uh, for your consideration. Uh, and um, and then um, on the conclusion, uh, I'm just wondering if, if there's any kind of a, a timetable that F, FAA can provide us uh, uh, to uh, to achieve to the the next level or any kind of a achievable majors on this thing. So thank you. So uh, if you want, uh, did you want to comment first, Brian, or give uh, Abby an opportunity to respond? Yeah, yeah. So thank you, well, Dr. So number one, my pen was busy as you were talking. Oh. So I, I took down all your notes. And as far as the timeline goes, um, we are waiting for the, the, youth, the Youth Advisory Committee's final report because we want to do something very strategic and comprehensive. And, and so that was in my earlier remarks, that's what I, I wanted to allude to the Women in Aviation Advisory Board and then the Youth um, Workforce uh, Advisory Committee as well, because we thought instead of doing three in parallel, it would be a lot more effective it, because there's so much overlap in the K through 12 space that we waited and do, do uh, something that's more strategic with all of them, but making sure that if there's anything unique in the AAAC report that we capture that as well. So what I, I think that, that report is due um, early fall. And so we, we'll come out with a strategic plan. In the meantime, we're going to chip away at the feedback that we've already gotten on the programs that we have. I hope and, and so stand by. Thank you. Okay, Brian. Yeah. 
Thank you, Houston, and thank you, Abby. I, I wanted to just return uh, kudos to, to, to Dr. Shu. Uh, Paul and I, I think, worked really, really well together, but it was an extraordinarily good effort on the part of everyone involved. I'm, I'm going to miss somebody here, but Kenji, uh, Vic, uh, Brad, Brad um, et cetera. I mean, it was just, and Bob, uh, it just, it was a great group. And, and I think the, a little overwhelming, Abby started with the numbers that Dave Messina did a great job of, of digging out and, um, and the numbers are really daunting, but you know what, we have those numbers for the entire aviation sector. And I think the really good news that, that we, we settled on or reinforced was that, that this is, I, I've used the term and others use it now, gateway, this is kind of a gateway uh, to aviation and we're, we're getting we're getting people interested at a very early age and that's really the key to success over the the medium term and you know, we call demographics the you know the dismal the dismal science because it takes a long time to change numbers and our numbers are not moving in the right direction right now uh, either from a diversity standpoint or from an overall um, absolute standpoint so we, we want to attract more people into this sector and the good news is we have a great tool to do it. So this is, uh, and, and, and it's not just specific uh, to UAS or, or AAM, it's, uh, it, it's important for all of the, the entire aviation sector. And I think what was a little daunting about this particular task was that we had, you know, in order to be effective, we need to think over the long-term, Houston, you've made me very uh, conscious of this in the context of diversity. We need to start very, very early. So. Uh, so I think that that's the reason why we think it's so important. Uh, the recommendations are so important and so pleased to have such a good response. Uh, and we stand ready. All the organizations in this room uh, are, are here effectively understanding this problem and ready to work with you on it. So, but we need your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I just, um, the amount of conversation these recommendations have started and the amount of thought that is going into even beyond these recommendations. So for example, there's a tremendous conversation going on about not only aviation programs, but making sure that people in other areas understand how aviation can benefit their work, agriculture, forestry, um, photography, all these areas, and, and we've seen in the past, once we get folks interested in aviation, they expand the envelope of all the people who participate in aviation, and, and they become more involved and they become uh, aware of aviation safety and, and all of that. So we're, we're looking for those force multipliers now too, you know, that we don't just go to a K through 12 and emphasize only aviation that we go out and make sure everyone knows how aviation can enhance their jobs, particularly in the, the small UAS or drone community. These are often sensors. It's not just about flying, it's about how they collect data that's later used in another application. So it's really started. I'm, I'm so grateful for these recommendations because everywhere I go, people are talking about the workforce of the future and how we get um, everyone engaged at a, or as many people as possible engaged as young as possible. So I know um, Jazz Baga has a question, has his hand up. Hi, good morning. Um, Houston, I'm jealous about the bourbon. So maybe we'll take a rain check on that. Abby, thank you for, um, <clears throat> thank you for this presentation. The question I have here is, I think there's a lot of people on this line that that all do really cool things with drones, um, you know, from Canary OAS to, you know, really great projects. When you think of education, um, we would love some guidance on what you need. Um, what I mean by this is we, we've got this virtual kind of hybrid environment going forward. How do we create these little bite-sized pieces of content that capture these, the children uh, with, you know, the cool of this industry? And the question would be for you folks is that where can we get some, architecture on you know what you need for content i think there's a lot of people here that could create content and then how do you distribute that content thank you so um jazz and my you know one of my former jobs i was the director for um technical training for air traffic controllers technicians and engineers at faa 
And micro learning, I think is what you're talking about. And I think that those bite-sized learning elements are a really powerful way to capture people's imagination and attention. And I thank you for that. Um, I'm going to, I'm too, Again, I've got my pen busy. I don't know if you can see it from there, but yeah. And we'll take that IOU. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So, um, in terms of a lot of these things, there is a lot of outreach going on, and that was part of what we determined in the, the work group. But the uh, one of the key things is whenever we do STEM outreach um, in the university, and we're trying to, of course go to underserved communities, really in our state reach the Alaska native population, um, really taking it and making it applicable to what they are doing, what they see every day is one of those things that really engages them. And um, in terms of the kids, we always do a career talk. And we also talk about what courses they need to take. So we emphasize you need to actually take communications classes because you're gonna be talking to stakeholders. You need to be able to read and write because you're gonna be in this business. You need to take business classes if you wanna be a business owner. But we also do talk cinematography and law enforcement. And so kids really like, oh, I can do drones and all of these other things. And it's exciting. You get them engaged and you get them thinking beyond the, the just the fact we're flying pickup trucks. You know, it's really, what is the mission? What is the payload? to get them thinking, oh, I can survey, you know, the river near my house and find out whether or not we're going to have flooding from ice jams. The kids start thinking about going beyond and doing the imagery and all those other things. And so if you really can relate it to what they want every day and give them that bite size, think about the possibilities, they'll take it and run and think of things you've never thought about. Thank you, Kathy. David, you had a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, more practical, um, a little bit more practical money, um, because nothing happens around here without it. Uh, quick question: In terms of the wor workforce grants uh, that the FAA got as part of the last uh, budget reauthorization, uh, I'm wondering about. Uh, if I recollect, it was like on the order of about 10 million. It may have been annually. Um, I'm, I'd like to know. Uh, what the subscription rate for that has been. In other words, are you oversubscribed for that, i.e. more applications than you have uh, money? Um, and then if you have any statistics on the graduation rates, because if it's working, uh, I think it's something that we would definitely be interested in looking for more opportunities uh, working with Congress on that. Thanks. All right, thanks. I've got that IOU. Yes, Robert. I think uh, Dave, we, we were on the same wavelength there. I was going to also ask that similar question from a from a congressional resource perspective, in terms of has there been an effort to you know if Congress asks so how much how many resources are going into uh, all this uh, you know this general area of activity, and then what's the delta to what's your your really ideal or optimal vision? That may be interesting to, to kind of see not only from an FAA perspective, but as you bring in some of the other agencies like NASA, or as you mentioned, the Department of Education. The other thing I would just mention is, is that you know, the president has nominated um, Dr. Arthi Prabhakar, um, former DARPA director, to now be the new director of Office of Science and Technology Policy. And she's uh, very passionate about STEM and diversity. And uh, once she gets confirmed by, by the Senate, she could be a, also another strong advocate within the White House in the broader um, set of, of STEM activities. Thank you. Can you change your mind? Okay. Well, thank you, Houston, and thank you, AAAC. Okay, uh, you know, I just again, just wanna say, uh, you know, wow. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing. And thank you, Jay, uh, for tasking AAA CEO with this monumental task. I, I was thinking of two, two of the most you know, impactful taskies that uh, this team has worked on, you know, the gender neutral, gender neutral language, which absolutely will transform how people think about this industry. And, and I'll just, you know, I'll point over to Brian, you know, the, the uh, former the, the, the organization of, you know, unmanned vehicle, you know, systems, now the the organization of uh, the association for uncrewed vehicle systems. So it's more than just words, right? It's, it's actions, activity, the same thing with, you know, the, uh, the noticed uh, air crew, right? It's those are the type of things that, you know, 
And I can tell you from a flight perspective in my operations, I had pilots saying, what, what are we doing? Why do they change that? It's like, so, so it, it starts a conversation, right? With which leads to change and people need to understand the why. And so when I think about, you know, this initiative, um, and um, the generational impact it's going to have. It's very, very powerful, you know, for the future. And I know yesterday in a bunch of meetings, manpower across the aviation sector, I know, you know, uh, Captain DePito agree with this, you know, manpower is one of those issues that just continues to come up in this community. And especially for, you know, this growing community, even more so because there's competing resources across the board. And so this initiative, I uh, really wanted to applaud, you know, Jay, you, Abby, and the team, we're taking a strategic approach. I think these recommendations integrated with the other advisory committees will definitely mean that this will be meaningful, lasting impact uh, for years to come. So just kudos to the team uh, for all the great work. So, you know, I, I was reading a book recently called uh, The Power Moments. And one of the uh, the precepts in there is, you know, pride, you know, certain moments, you know, fill you with pride. This is definitely one of those, those moments, I think, for us as a committee that we can all be very prideful of. So well done. So with that, uh, we'll um, you know, move forward. Yes. And uh, next uh, we have uh, you know, uh, Carrie Lyons uh, uh, to present her briefing on the AA infrastructure update. So Carrie, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Captain Mills. And thank you, Jay and AAAC for the invitation. It's uh, definitely a timely topic. Um, we have quite a few uh, facilities out there that are starting to entertain proposals for electric charging stations and vertiports, all in support of advanced air mobility um, coming to an airport or a vertiport near you soon. So I'm Carrie Lyons. I'm the technical advisor for new and emerging entrant integration within FAA's Office of Airports. Um, I work with a team of three other uh, outstanding specialists, all devoted full time to the safe integration of new and emerging entrants and technology on our airports, vertiports, and heliports in the, the nation. Um, so next slide, please. So to get us started, I, I wanted to baseline, and I think many of you are very familiar with this slide. It's from our colleagues in the UAS Integration Office. Just wanted to you know, remind everyone that you know, FAA's goal when it comes to AAM integration in the near term, initial operations, is really to use every tool that we have in our current toolbox, all of our existing regulations, and um, use those to help bring in the initial operations. For the FAA's Office of Airports, it is the same. And we're gonna go through some of those tools that we have to try and enable those initial operations for advanced air mobility. Um, remember AAM, it's not a singular technology. In fact, it's a collection of new and emerging technologies, some of which still in development, some of which will still need to be invented, um, you know, to fully enable the transport of passengers and cargo in urban environments, as well as uh, more rural environments too. Um, so under the AAM umbrella includes a variety of use cases. As you see here, we have the urban air mobility use case. We have the regional air mobility use case, which many of our Florida airports are already hearing about now from a variety of operators that are looking to do some of that regional air mobility use case. You have the public services use case, the cargo delivery, as well as private and recreational vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. This is a graphic I love. I can't wait for our colleagues in NASA this afternoon. I understand based off of the ebook that they actually have a new graphic that I am I'm going to be looking at today. Um, but this is just shows a, a great representation of the very diverse um, uh, scenarios that we will see occurring under the AAM umbrella, as well as the timelines for what we can see occur soonest to more technology unlocks needed for those to come around. So if you look at the green lines, those are the use cases we're going to see um, initially, right? So um, your airport to city type transfer, but more technology needs to be in place to really see an uptick, for instance, in your uh, rooftop to rooftop type of scenarios. And so um, we are mindful of the scenarios that are in red, but we are definitely working full steam ahead 
on enabling the green as well as the yellow on the screen. Uh, next slide, please. So again, working on that and enabling those initial operations, what do we expect and what are we planning for? So we definitely are seeing a, a, a variety of manufacturers looking to build uh, a aircraft that fall under the VTOL model, the vertical takeoff and landing model. That is not to say that we aren't aware of some manufacturers also looking at short takeoff and landing and looking to use future vertiports for enabling their operations. Um, but the first that we see coming through the door will likely be some of those VTOL operations. Um, that aircraft design will be type certified by the FAA. Um, piloted operations likely will be the majority of those first initial operations. Again, we do realize that there are manufacturers that are looking um, to take the pilot off the aircraft immediately, um, but we are um, uh, focused in right now from an airports, from a, a vertiport standard on the pilot on board. Uh, electric powered aircraft, again, we know that there's hybrid and hydrogen concepts being looked at as well. Um, we are for sure seeing operators knocking on the doors of our airports today, as well as heliports. Um, but as we're going to talk about here soon, there may be some modifications that are needed to enable um, operations at those facilities. And we are aware of some uh, greenfield, brand new vertiports, as well as repurposed facilities to be vertiports. Um, we envision that there will be operational exemptions and waivers needed um, based on unique aircraft performance. Okay, uh, and then that um, those operations will unify, utilize, excuse me, the current defined airspace with current air traffic control and procedures there. Next slide, please. So that was the initial look, but what are we thinking about in years to come and keeping our minds on as we're starting to develop guidance? So we are mindful that maturity is going to look like your highly automated aircraft needing highly automated ground infrastructure. We are aware that Many of the manufacturers and operators are looking to um, go to simplified vehicle operations or um, then getting to uncrewed operations. We're being mindful of those changes and making sure that our future standards are flexible or timely to accommodate those shifts. We're also mindful that there is a desire to get to high density vertiports and our colleagues at NASA are working on research in that area now. And then to really enable uh, AAM, especially in the urban environments, we are looking at a mesh of smart transportation where a passenger or cargo, it's a seamless transition um, between transportation modes and networks. Next slide, please. So why do you have someone here from the Office of Airports talking to you today? So let me give you a little history about the Office of Airports and what it is that we do in transition to what it is we're going to be doing about AAM infrastructure. So FAA's Office of Airports, um, with our Associate Administrator here today, Ms. Shanetta Griffin, um, we have a mission of um, being the world leaders when it comes to creating a safe and efficient system of airports. You know, our, our vision here is advancing that safest um, most efficient system of airports in the world, doing so with integrity, collaboration, and innovation. And I can definitely tell you when it comes to innovation, again, we are standing up an office where we are specifically engaged in facilitating new and emerging entrant integration within the ground infrastructure. And that is our full-time mission of supporting operators, airports, um, stakeholders in, in helping get in the door to our infrastructure. Next slide, please. So some of the key functions that we have within the Office of Airports include, we have over 500 airports in the US airport system that are certificated under 14 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 139. Um, we have inspectors that go out and inspect those facilities. 
Um, just know, you know, our, our, our number here is we have 19,000 landing facilities in the nation. Only around 500 of those are certificated. Around 3,000 or so of those are part of our national airport system plan. So there's quite a few other landing facilities out there that aren't necessarily part of the federal oversight system. We also have um, the role of establishing airport safety standards. And so our advisory circulars, we have advisory circulars on a variety of topics, including airport design, heliport design, signage, marking, master planning, um, aircraft rescue, firefighting, um, uh, equipment, uh, emergency planning, variety of those topics all fall under the office of airports. We also pro provide airport planning guidance and support. Um, you know, we assist airports with master planning, communities, um, states with system planning, environmental review and noise compatibility, 14 Code of Federal Regu Regulations, excuse me, part 150 uh, for noise studies. And then uh, a big part of our job, the financial assistance programs, our airport improvement program, passenger facility charges, and the variety of different programs that have come in um, over the past few years. We also have responsibility for ensuring those airports that have received federal financial assistance or conveyances of property are complying with their federal ob obligations. And then, a great part of our community is, is also the technology research, airport technology and research development that occurs at our William J. Hughes Technical Center in Atlantic City. So we're going to focus in on that second bullet next. Um, the establishing of airport safety standards, because the Office of Airports is working uh, feverishly to develop vertiport standards. Next slide, please. So many of you may be familiar with the fact that the FAA did have an advisory circular on vertiport design many years ago. In fact, it was canceled in 2010 due to a lack of compatible aircraft. It was originally designed, I believe, for the, the Osprey aircraft. The standards that we are going to need in the future are going to need to address the wide variety of aircraft that will be falling under the advanced air mobility umbrella. We're going to need information out there on, um, you know, the facilities that are required for the boarding of passengers um, and uh, cargo by these aircraft. You're going to notice that we're working towards developing performance-based standards, and that's a little different than many of our other advisory circulars that have been prescriptive in the past. These facilities are all going to um, have a wide variety of configurations, and that is why we're going the route of performance-based um, because of the variety of aircraft, their performance capabilities, and then the level of throughput that's expected depending on the facilities. You know, we're hearing everything from um, a facility that may get an operation every once in a while to your high-density um, vertiports. Uh, next slide, please. So our future standard um, that we're working on will include things like, you see her on the left, the landing area design um, and the layout and geometry of that, the approach and departure paths, load bearing requirements of the facility, the electric propulsion and charging stations. We're also mindful that we may need to be thinking about facilities that are going to have both traditional um, aviation type gasoline um, as well as possibly hydrogen um, and charging, visual aids for piloted aircraft. We're also gonna be needing to think about sensor technology for your autonomous aircraft, safety requirements for your piloted aircraft, and then noise um, requirements. And then the biggest thing here, the dimensional standards are all gonna depend on the aircraft's critical dimension and performance capabilities. Um, and I would be remiss if I don't note that our airport engineering division has the lead on this standard and they are working feverishly, as I said, to develop future standards for vertiports. Next slide, please. 
So to get to that standard, our Airport Safety and Standards Division reached out to our research arm, our research side, um, our Airport Technology Research and Development Branch out of the William J. Hughes Technical Center in Atlantic City to start Vertiport Research. It started in 2019. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, many of you may have heard it was a bit slow to start. There was quite a bit of hesitancy of uh, providing information to the FAA. Um, you know, that I think that there's, um, we've got really good relationships with many of the big um, aircraft manufacturers. They know within them when they give the FAA information, we're able to protect it. So we took a lot of time establishing relationships with many of these new companies that maybe haven't had a relationship with the FAA and walk them through the various protections that are out there and available to them if they're providing us with their performance data of the aircraft that they're designing. Um, so we did put out an RFP in 2019, got limited information, but we have since been very successful working through aircraft certification um, office to establish those relationships with many of the leading manufacturers to learn more about the aircraft that will likely be entering into service um, initially under the AAM umbrella. Next slide, please. So a little bit more on our research approach here. Um, we are currently in our modeling and simulation phase. We completed a literature review. Um, after modeling and simulation is completed, we will be doing a operational testing. The picture that you see on the screen is our current research heliport out of Atlantic City. We intend to uh, modify that to a research vertiport, um, pending hopefully getting some manufacturers and operators to join us uh, at the tech center. And that is something if any of your companies are interested uh, in doing some of the testing at the tech center, please reach out to us. Um, it is something that we definitely would like to talk with you more about. Um, while the research is initially geared towards VTOL, we are mindful and in including into some of the research STOL aircraft as well, um, so that we can address that in our future advisory circular. Next slide, please. We also have been very successful because of the partnerships that we have in place, including our partnership with NASA as part of their national campaign and some of the internal NASA FAA Advanced Air Mobility Group efforts under the various um, uh, uh, umbrellas of uh, infrastructure, um, airspace, uh, and the like. We also are working with Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab um, as part of an agreement to learn more about electrification. Under that study, we're going to be looking at the vertiport charging needs, cybersecurity concerns, as well as hazard evaluation. Next slide, please. So folks are already starting to knock on the doors of our airports out there in the system. So how are we addressing early adopters? Um, we realize that our advisory circular is going to take time to get it right, to draft it, get it out there, get industry comment and finalize it. In fact, we probably won't have that advisory circular completed until late 2024, early 2025. So guidance is needed for industry now. So we've used some of the other tools that we have in our toolbox, this time an engineering brief. We have it out as draft right now and accepted industry comments on it, as well as hosted an industry day with our lead engineer and our um, colleagues and other lines of business. Um, so that folks would have a chance to learn more about how we created the interim guidance and this interim standard. You're going to notice that the engineering brief is prescriptive. Um, it is uh, focuses in on um, uh, a limited number of aircraft uh, created through a um, composite aircraft. Now, we also are using existing regulation to support FAA's review of infrastructure like vertiports or charging stations. Currently under part 157, if you pull up 
157 in the, the Code of Federal Regulations, you're going to notice that actually the term vertiport is still there. Um, uh, we've got a little bit of homework to do to update our forms, but the term actually still exists within that regulation. So any new vertiport that is proposed in the system will require notification to the FAA uh, and then an airspace review. Uh, any facilities that are being built or modified on existing infrastructure that's already in the system um, will go through our typical review that comes in under part 77. Um, so various forms out there, part, you'll hear terms like uh, form 7460, 7480. These are all the forms that will be submitted by a proponent um, of a vertiport or charging station uh, for the FAA to conduct the airspace review of those particular um, uh, infrastructure. Airports that have received federal money or um, property conveyances are also required to submit an update to their airport layout plan. Um, that depicts these new facilities on that drawing. Uh, next slide, please. Before I go into the engineering brief, I wanted to say that um, early coordination is going to be key. Um, while we have this engineering brief, which we plan to have final by the end of the summer, um, Many of our other organizations are still getting guidance and policy out to their field facilities on how to integrate advanced air mobility aircraft. And so early coordination will be very critical for early operations. Um, and so we're encouraging communities, um, we're encouraging airports, states, that have an interest in advanced air mobility, but aren't necessarily sure where they would like to place that infrastructure to reach out through their regional administrator, their FAA regional administrator, um, that will be able to help facilitate uh, any additional information or answers to questions they may have. But for those communities or facilities that know where they want to go, um, we've got, again, those existing tools to use, like going to the FAA's airport's district office or regional office, um, and they will be able to support that proponent with any forms that need to be submitted and the reviews that need to be completed for those facilities. So the draft engineering brief 105, it's currently available on our FAA.gov website, um, and uh, it will be there until we publish the final. It's going to serve as that interim guidance, that interim prescriptive guidance until we're able to get the advisory circular out. There is an emphasis in there on safety critical areas. We realized that there were many comments asking us to go well beyond that. Those are things we're taking into consideration for the, the future advisory circular or other advisory guidance. It uses a composite aircraft. Um, or a reference aircraft. You know, we did get a lot of comments on the terms that we're using there. Um, and it's based on data that we received um, from nine of the um, uh, manufacturers that are kind of out there leading on their uh, development. And we had to go this route instead of, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, hope that heliports could be used or can be used. And we're very mindful of that. You know, there's cost efficiencies with using existing infrastructure, but we had to take a conservative approach in this first interim guidance. We, we don't necessarily have um, a lot of validated data out there. And so the FAA needed to take that conservative approach. We need more information, more data and research on things like downwash and outwash on failure conditions, on landing precision, climb and descend gradients. And so you're going to notice that the engineering brief, the, the standard in there for vertiport is, is in between a GA heliport and a transport category heliport, you know, for, for basic terminology there. Um, and, and we will look at that standard. We will reevaluate that standard as we get more data. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to take a whole lot of time on this. Um, my, my, if you have questions, our engineers will be able, happily able to answer them for you. 
this chart, which came out of the engineering brief, may change when we go to final. And that's why I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We received many comments on the engineering brief, hundreds of comments. And our engineers, like I said, have been feverishly working to adjudicate those comments. Um, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for what you are going to see if you open up that engineering brief, take a look at it before it goes final. Next slide, please. Same thing here. We did receive many great comments to us on the, um, the current touchdown and liftoff area, the final approach and takeoff area, as well as the broken wheel. Um, and these are all things that our engineers are um, uh, investigating in those comments right now. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps? You know, we are on track to issue the engineering brief later this summer. We are remaining on track as well with our research uh, and getting to a advisory circular late 2024, early 2025. We are anticipating expanding our vertiport research into more areas like hydrogen fueling. Um, we, and I think you all know this better, better than, than, than some of us do, there's lots of moving parts. Um, and so bear with us, you know, uh, the FAA is a, a very large agency, but we are making great steps to coordinate through our various lines of business. When a manufacturer goes knocking on the door of our aircraft certification office, they're looping in the office of airports, flight standards, um, uh, the UAS integration office into those conversations so that uh, manufacturer and operator is, is, is able to give that presentation one time. And we're able to start signaling some of the areas that uh, we may need more information on. Maybe we have concerns about, or maybe that we want to work more with the manufacturer operator on to understand. Um, expect that we're going to do that crawl, walk, run, or crawl, walk, run, fly approach, just like the agency has done for UAS. Again, we're gonna leverage as much as we can to get us those initial operations to enable those. Um, but there are gonna be more areas, we're gonna need more research and more data to be able to unlock more. And then we're gonna to continue to collaborate with industry and international partners. Again, um, you know, um, teams like the one that I'm a part of, that is our job is to, to get out there, collaborate and connect all of these folks with the subject matter experts to learn, be able to learn more, to collaborate and, um, you know, be able to ask questions when we need to. So uh, next slide, please. Um, just wanna say thank you very much uh, for the invite uh, and, and being able to brief you all today. Um, like I said, here with me today is our associate administrator, um, our director, uh, John Dermody, I believe, is probably watching online, and uh, I'm here to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for that very insightful brief. Uh, any questions from the team? Just, yes. just a comment. I, you know, you, you referred to it as the, um, the final engineering brief. It's going to have to be a living document, and certainly we won't know this year all the things we need to know about alternate fuels, for example. The industry is still trying to decide if hydrogen is the right answer, and we're not sure that it is, and we're not sure that it isn't. But certainly, you know, we know a lot more about kerosene and gasoline, and electricity is going to be really, really important. And those are things that could be, you know, finalized early. But alternate fuel types is going to, a lot of work is going to continue. My team's meeting with John actually tomorrow, and uh, so we're we're going to continue the conversation about infrastructure and technology. But I just I want to say that engineering brief is going to need to be a living document. Thank you, by the way, for the work you guys are doing. Thank you, if, if I may. Um, so uh, our engineering brief is going to just be the living document until our advisory circular comes out. Um, we are mindful that we may need to update it um, before the AC. And so we're going, we're keeping that in the back of our minds and our, our business planning of whether that's something that needs to be done. Um, the advisory circular for sure, our airport engineering division has a heavy lift. Um, they realize that is gonna need to be a living document for sure as well. Um, the initial advisory circular, I kind of wanna make sure we, we, we set, a, set our expectations here. We think that that initial 2024, 2025 document, again, it's gonna be for those initial operations 
for probably the aircraft that we're gonna see either certified by then or that are gonna be coming in the pipeline. Um, but we know that we're going to need to update it for sure, anything that's coming along that doesn't necessarily have that. If we get into a position like we are today where we need something out quickly, we do have vehicles like engineering briefs where we can get that, that information out to the community quickly. And so we'll use whatever we need to be able to get those standards out, but thank you so much. We have a question from uh, Jazz Banga. Hi, Carrie. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm really excited about all these future applications of drones, and but I think there's a first order problem that I know most of the airports here in the U.S. are dealing with, which is the clear and present danger around drone traffic, either near the airport, on the airport, or you know during an approach path. The question I have for you is, you know, what is being done to accelerate the integration of these long range detection systems so that, you know, our air traffic controllers can have this information accessible to them? I know it's been a long process. Just wanted to ask, how can we accelerate getting these first order capabilities that, you know, will hopefully stop uh, interruptions and, and operational disruptions at these airports? So thank you very much for your question. A uh, um, little bit outside the, the lane of vertiports. Um, so I will, I'll start to take a bit of a stab at that and, uh, and, and hand it over to anyone else. Um, so um, our, our airports team, as well as the team out of the uh, tech center and the Office of Security and Hazardous Materials are working feverishly, <laughs> it's my word of the day, on, um, uh, on the detection and mitigation research. And so that is well underway. We also know that there are airports already out uh, that are um, seeking to have detection equipment on their facilities. So we're working hand in hand with them uh, if they are trying to kind of get out um, ahead of the, the agency where we are on our research. And so those airports that are seeking to have detection equipment, um, we are um, making sure that they are filing appropriate notice to the agency that we're conducting our reviews of those systems through our um, uh, obstruction evaluation and analysis um, systems and tools and um, making sure that all those are done safely. So I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add anything more to that. Yeah, hey, let's not forget that's very one way let's also consider the technology that may be on some of these drones to detect and avoid. Um, I, I get the seductive nature of the, the tower seeing everything, um, but there's the technology is changing um, and it's changing rapidly. And so we should not discount the stuff coming the other way, which may be of higher fidelity. Um, so that's why we need to really make sure we have a plan for BB loss and how that's achieved, because it may not be necessarily uh, always put on the tower and increasing that workload. It could be the other way through technology. Well, not could be, it will be. I guarantee you it will be. Hey, whilst I got the microphone, um, one of the things that, um, uh, thank you for the pitch. Um, it, it was wonderful. I love the way you walked through it. It was really well thought through. Uh, all the major elements were there. Um, there's a couple of slides that beg the timeline question, like when, um, and as an industry representative, I think one of the things that we are um, grateful from the FAA is the level of thought that's gone into each of the steps in all environments, but what we don't have is clarity around timeline. Um, and without that clarity of timeline, sometimes I feel concerned that we are finding ourselves in a position where the cart is ahead of the horse, and then we're all waiting and trying to shove a square peg in a round hole because we designed to something that's unclear. And that's a really awful position to be in for your folks, our folks, and the industry at large. And we all start with the true north of safety. So this is not a speed over safety equation. We all start with the con ops of safety and how we achieve it. But without a timeline, we could be designing the wrong thing. Um, and we can indefinitely wait. And 2025, in this day and age, I mean, two years ago, the world changed, right? And that was two years ago. So what's gonna happen by 2025, we'll wait for regulations that are out of date, potentially, while they're still being written. So how do, we, how do we help or how do we vector in on timelines that we can all support, not 
trying to underestimate the difficulty, not trying to talk about, but I think we've got to get over this big agency sort of deal and it's difficult. And how do we how do we move that along? Because that's that's a big issue. Thanks. I appreciate the comment. And I, I think that really goes back to that collaboration with industry, getting a better understanding of, of uh, you know, when are you going to be coming knocking on the door of a particular community or infrastructure? One of the biggest areas that we still need data on, and, and we're working with our colleagues, um, uh, some of the economists in our, in our organization, um, to understand better the governorship, the governorship, the, the ownership of these facilities, right? Are, are most of these facilities going to be public use? Will they be coming knocking on the door to the agency for federal funding? Will they wanna be part of a system plan? Having a better understanding of the numbers of those can help us in trying to back out when we would need certain policies in place. Having a better understanding of, okay, when would those facilities start seeing a first operation of a given 135 carrier or some other type of AAM operator, those are the things that we still need to, to, to get more information from industry on to be able to help get to that timeline I think that you're looking for. So thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Slide 35 um, would be great if we had some timelines around that, indicative timelines around slide, slide 35. Hey, hey, Dave, I was just gonna add a comment um, to your thought about, um, you know, the safety piece and the technology. Uh, and I think this really what it comes down to, I think all of us can, can agree, and that is you know, getting the safety standards right. So if you establish, and that's really the key, right? We get the safety standards right, then whatever technology comes will be prepared. So I think that's where, you know, we need to, you know, our level of engagement and helping to make sure that the safety standards are right and that we've got consensus there so that technology can engage and advance without interference. And so couldn't agree more but it's really about getting the safety standards right because no one wants to go back, right, and invest millions of dollars and change technology when you don't have the right standards. So that's really the key, but the def definitely a good point. Uh, you, yeah, uh, great presentation, Carrie. I really appreciated it. Uh, one of the questions, well, the question that I have actually uh, dovetails nicely with, with what David said. Um, how much do you think the design requirements and operational standards for Verta ports will change from Hellport design standards. I mean, do you anticipate a large delta emerging from testing at the tech center? And the reason I ask is you, you know how to measure failure conditions, you know how to measure climb and descent rates, you know how to measure uh, downwash, and it, can you already leverage some of the things that you already do from the heliport design? Because I, I think a lot of people here from industry are worried about those timelines. You have a lot of companies uh, investing a lot of money. Safety is number one, but is there, can you leverage what we already have to the extent where that these timelines can really be accelerated? Because this is great technology that's actually going to have a lot of benefit to society. Yeah, that's a great point. I think we are very mindful of um, the economies of scale that can be had if you are able to use existing infrastructure. Um, again, we took that conservative approach. You know, our, our lead vertiport engineer is also our lead heliport engineer. And so he is very mindful of these points, but we had to take that conservative approach while we're still working to get the data to support um, a smaller footprint, right? And so, um, you know, right in the beginning of the, the vertiport engineering brief, um, he's been able to walk through, here's the re rationale why, we couldn't support using the heliport advisory circular out of the gate. But with that said, we are willing to work with industry, get more information, get more performance data. If we need to right size this, uh, as time goes on, we're willing to do that. We just need the data behind it. And so we already have companies that are coming to us, wanting to work with us to try to figure that out. I hope that helps. So if we go, uh, Dr. Shen, and then uh, Brandon. Thank you. Oh, uh, like David and Kenzie uh, already mentioned, that this is really great that Office of Airports are showing a, a proactive interest in, in uh, hard work there. So as, as a person also representing the uh, AAM community, I, I thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Um, if I can just add a couple of thoughts on UAM for now. Um, as, as David mentioned, it, it's just 
very logical. You're covering all the elements. But um, having been in the trench, <laughs> coming from government uh, with the industry, uh, what we are seeing is just about every, every real estate developers, they like to get into this market because there's, there's a this really rosy picture out there. Right? So I'm hearing a lot of uh, real estate uh, developers, hey, can I put this uh, body port? But actually it's like a body stop at the top of my building that I'm building. Well, not really, <laughs> because there are all kinds of issues there, right? But they don't know. And um, they want to build this uh, big uh, shopping mall. And can, can we do this? So I, I've been getting, my company has been getting a lot of interest. So I think we need to, it's not too early to involve uh, real estate developers in this discussion. So that's, that's one point. Another point is um, when it comes to UAM, it is not a replacement of anything. Uh, it, it is an augmentation of a mobility in a inner city. So we have to compete <laughs> with uh, existing uh, transportation modes. And if we cannot provide enormous time saving, this market will never pan out in my humble opinion. So um, if we cannot uh, make sure that ground and air uh, seamless integration, uh, people will not take uh, this UAM as an uh, alternative mode of transportation. So I think the UAM community all agree that probably the earliest application is from major airport to the uh, city center. So airports, we can all talk about this and do this uh, accordingly, but it, it's got to land somewhere. <laughs> once it takes off from airport. And it, it, it's like uh, when I moved to Washington DC, my real estate uh, agent said, it's a location, location, location. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in this case, I think it applies because you, you just don't want to build body ports somewhere that people don't want to go. And uh, it, high traffic and high density areas, the real estate in major cities is just enormously expensive. So um, the in, the, so my second point is we got to involve uh, ground transportation folks uh, with the with, uh, UAM community. So I'll, I'll recommend FAA for doing already really great job. Uh, if you think about how to involve uh, real estate developers and also ground uh, transportation. Thank you, Dr. Shin. Uh, for time's sake, I know we've got a lot of questions. We're going to take uh, one more, and then you know, we'll uh, cir certainly circle back if we need to come back. But uh, Brad, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Captain Mills. So, Kerry, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my question should be pretty quick, uh, and this might be out of the vertiport lane as well. However, we know that no matter how automated these vertiports become, they're still going to require ground support personnel. Um, and my question to you is, I know you're probably capturing a lot of good data. So even if this isn't going to be included in the report and we start to look at different types of, of power sources, be it electric or we start looking at hydrogen, there's going to be a lot of definition that's going to have to be built into the roles that will evolve. We'll have traditional roles and I, uh, that exist today. And I think we'll have new roles that will be created just, just for this, this type of vertiport uh, situation. So my question to you is, uh, one, is that even something that you're considering at this point? Because I know you're highly focused on technology. But two, if you're capturing data around that, are you passing that on somewhere so that we can start building that into job descriptions and training that can be used uh, to staff these vertiports? Thank you. Yeah, so the agency as a whole is, is very mindful of the, the different types of jobs and roles that will be definitely needed for AAM and the advancement of the various use cases. I would say that, yeah, we are hyper-focused right now on the safety critical uh, design and standards 
for the vertiports. But I think we are mindful that if we, we do notice that there's something new coming out, we're noting it. I wouldn't say we've collected any data in that area. That may be an area of future research that we that may be necessary. And, and there are a variety of um, uh, vehicles we could use to, to get that information for the agency in the future. But I've definitely noted it here. Um, and so if we do get anything from that, we'll make sure we share. Thanks. Okay, one more uh, yeah, question, uh, real quick. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know the rules, I didn't turn my stuff on. So, uh, good presentation. I just want to add some of my questions, but there's two comments I'll offer. Um, the, the question regarding the real estate developers, what I would recommend in subgrant to each real estate developer, you, you work with the building code officials. There's one organization that sells building codes. All real estate officials has to get their code, um, their, their plans reviewed anyway. So if they incorporate that in their standards. I think interesting for me in all this discussion that there's nothing mentioned about the community. At the end of the day, the community is going to have the, you're going to have most opposition for your integration of AM into the into the industry. So, um, what work are you guys doing with the industry, especially around noise? Uh, because noise for vertical ports that is new to a community that doesn't have an airport, new noise is probably more annoying to them than around the existing airports. I think in, um, dealing with the community is very important. And then finally, on the pilot program, Joint Detection Pilot Program, SeaTac Airport, which I represent, um, is involved in the pilot program. The tech center is doing testing on technologies right now, a little bit behind schedule, but the after technologies are um, identified, they'll go out to airports like SeaTac for testing. So just updated with that on the question. So that's it. My questions are just on the right. No, no, thank, thank, thank you, Jeffrey, and, and, and very timely and insightful. And I think it uh, really kind of points out, I was thinking just to kind of tying things together. And, and that is, first of all, you know, uh, you know Shanetta and, and Carrie, thank you all you know, so much for this very insightful briefing. We know that this space, you guys are already doing so much work. You know, you know this group is a group of stakeholders from across the industry, right? And I think listening to what you guys are doing, and, and quite frankly, I know Jay, and the team will look for opportunities to task this group to assist where we can, you know, to add thought leadership uh, to some of those opportunities, just as you're pointing out there, Jeffrey, from a community perspective or whether ever else that might be, you know, Dr. Shen, in terms of making sure we got the right folks engaged. So we certainly look forward to, to ongoing, ongoing support in any way possible. And, you know, thank you so much for the very uh, insightful brief. Uh, so with that, we're going to uh, move on, uh, you know, very thankful for David uh, Silver and, and Selena Reynolds. Uh, for their leadership of a task group of 13 strategic framework uh, for advanced uh, air mobility near term in term is one of the uh, taskings that Jay and his team gave us and so I want to pass it on to you for an interim update thanks you uh, David and Shalita. thanks Houston uh, thanks Jay uh, thanks for uh, on behalf of Salita and myself thank you for uh, tasking us with this uh, what we think is a critical task uh, we think that uh, we very much appreciate the fact that the FA released their strategic framework. It's something that the community has been looking for for quite some time um, and offers a potential roadmap as we move forward. And uh, we were appreciative again of the opportunity to comment on it and uh, give, give some thoughts back to it. Um, as I get started here, you'll notice we call this a interim uh, report. Uh, we are not quite finished, we think, with the work uh, that uh, is required of us. Uh, we have uh, collected a number of comments. It's now a matter of putting together our final report uh, prior, uh, prior to giving the final report out. So today, I'll, I and Salida, who is joining us uh, via the Zoom call, uh, hope to give you just a little bit of a flavor of what, we, what our initial thoughts are on this topic. So uh, next slide, please, Gary. Oh, great. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, like everything, uh, we always have a lot of people who uh, are very passionate about this. And so I wanna thank the uh, people uh, who have joined us on this particular journey. We uh, had a large group of people volunteer, both from within the AAC, but also external SMEs uh, made themselves available to us. And we found that very, very useful in our conversation. So we'll go ahead with our next slide. Um, so from an overview, um, so one of the things that we actually uh, initially struggled with was um, we wanted to make sure that we got it right. So actually we went back to Jay 
and we wanted to make sure that we truly understood what the tasking was. Um, so we, we refined it a little bit, I think, in terms of our understanding. Uh, and you can see up there uh, the guidance that Jay gave us in the conversation. Uh, the first of all was uh, the FA wants to make sure that they're asking the right questions. Um, and I would read that, make sure they're answering the necessary questions because uh, in an area like AAM, there is a potential to want to know everything. Uh, and I don't think that's necessary. I think it's making sure that you know the right things as part of your decision-making criteria will lead you to, uh, to David's point, very timely decisions that will meet the needs of industry and the needs of safety. Uh, secondly, uh, focus primarily you know, on the near-term operations, um, the getting this off the ground, no pun intended, uh, with the goal of that we would be scaling from there. And then uh, that the FA's use of this uh, data would be to drive their own internal work plans. Uh, one of the other things that we made sure was that we produced, made sure that everybody on our group understood what we were talking about when we were talking about AAM. And you can see, I will read it there, um, uh, the definition uh, that was uh, provided or that we came up with. I, I think it is important to note that we did break out UAM and RAM as two separate things, uh, noting that uh, the standards may be different. The questions may be slightly different based upon what particular issue that we're trying to solve. Uh, we've met uh, three times as a large group. Uh, we broke up into subgroups. We broke the doc document up into different parts to help us focus our discussions. And uh, as I mentioned, we will be uh, producing the final report prior to the next uh, meeting of the AAAC. Next slide. All right, so uh, in terms of the uh, the aircraft section um, of the document, a couple key takeaways uh, was, uh, these are more takeaways as opposed to particular questions. Um, in terms of the, uh, the CECI, uh, we uh, definitely, there was the document left a little, for lack of a better term, uh, to be desired uh, in terms of what the actual role of CECI is um, in terms of coming into the FAA as the first point of engagement. Uh, for the uh, designers of these equipment, uh, of the airframes themselves. Um, and, you know, we'll also note that the gates that were there were very, very high level. Um, and I'm going to go back to something that, again, I'm going to name check David again. Um, project management, the use of gates, the use of schedules and project management, critical, absolutely critical um, as we move through this provided that we as industry provide the right information, right? You can't hit a gate if we don't give you the right stuff. But once we give you the right stuff, we definitely want to make sure we're working through a gated process in terms of deliverables for all parties. Um, it is good to see the FA lines of business co collaborating more definitely uh, between, you know, the great briefing by Kerry uh, prior to this. And I know the FA is having a, a high level executive committee stood up on this, but, you know, we cannot reiterate enough that the the hand in hand uh between you know avs arp and the uh, the all the other uh, parts atc ato you know are absolutely moving in lockstep with each other um we've had a number of what i would call i'm going to call out the garmin auto land specifically misses in recent years where the certification and the ato were not aligned um that's a great example of where uh a safety product took three years longer to roll out to the field than I think was beneficial. Um, we would hate to uh, see ATA, uh, UAM, AM follow the same sort of path as we move forward. Um, uh, and uh, I've already kind of covered the, uh, uh, the gated process as we move forward. So we'll move on to the next, next slide, please. And, 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 I need to make sure, Salida, did you have anything to add on that one? I apologize, I should have asked you. Okay, all right. Um, airspace, um, we, you'll notice the use of the term safe integration over segregated airspace. Uh, we are not by any means advocated uh, long-term uh, segregated airspace, but we understand that initial prior 2024 to 28, initial air operations may require specific routes and structured use, in other words, to prevent uh, so we use segregated versus separated. 
knowing that obviously long term we do not foresee most of the party does not see the need for segregated uh, airspace. I'm going to take going to add a little bit of an editorial here real quick, and it's this. Um, I say that's kind of the group view. It is not the consensus view. I think that we, our job is not to find consensus. Our job is to raise the questions that we think need to be raised, knowing that so you may get some differing opinions on this as we move forward. Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge that. Um, training and cert of AM should be proportional to operational risk. And you hear a lot about the FA risk continuum, right? We want to make sure that we're utilizing that as much as possible. Um, it's a published FAA document, so it should be a, our guide as we work our way through this. That applies to both aircraft certification, but also to crew, uh, crew training, flight operations, et cetera. We want to make sure that we're safety is our North Star, uh, but we are not overly conservative where conservatism is not warranted. Um, and then uh, Spectrum actually showed up in a number of places. Why wouldn't it? Uh, because all, it's all we deal with. It's all that it seems to be uh, my part-time job is dealing with 5G and C-band. So uh, the, the, the availability of spectrum for safety equipment and for the operations of, and this obviously pertains also to UAS as well as to AM, is going to be critical and making sure that that coordination is occurring early in the process, that rulemaking is occurring early in the process uh, from the FCC, in cooperation with the FA is going to be the critical for the development uh, of of these uh, vehicles into the future. So we'll keep moving. David, I'll, I'll jump in and add something really quickly here. And I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in person. I'm actually at a board meeting for the um, Intelligent Transportation Society of America uh, here in Seattle. So David and I just switched coasts. Uh, for this event, but really um, very, very grateful I can be here with you for the hybrid event. And thanks to all of the staff for the hard work to make that happen. I just wanted to share that um, concern about the spectrum is something that ITS America is also keenly interested in. Um, so I just want to offer that there are, are opportunities for uh, alliances and cooperation um, and thinking about the spectrum's use for AVs on the ground, uh, autonomous vehicles on the ground, um, and and really the safety critical um, uh, purpose that it serves. Great. Thank, thanks, Lita. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Operations. Um, I don't think I saw in the document SMS, so we, we actually just specifically called it out as always being foundational to what we do, especially with the rulemaking that's going on right now at the FAA. Um, I've mentioned uh, airman qualifications. Um, we also, from an operation standpoint, we know that the system management for crude versus uncrewed will evolve over time. Um, you know, vehicle to vehicle, you know, ground control to vehicle, those types of things. Uh, we just need to make sure that we, again, we 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 need to solve the near-term problems first, but long-term we need that flexibility in the system, right? Um, as as we move forward to ensure that we can scale again to the future envisioned operational usage, right? Um, uh, the other thing, I'm just probing it, looking at uh, the last one, yeah, standards. I, I think that's a, uh, the last comment I think is really, as much as possible, we really need to drive the use of standards in this in this industry. It's a, it's a, it's a brand new, vehicle, right? It's brand new operations. We have an opportunity to do it right, right? We know that prescriptive rulemaking leads to challenges later on. You know, we still have documents that, rec you know, reference piston engines, and et cetera, uh, that are out there. Um, let's make sure that we use standards uh, where appropriate um, and engage with the standards community as much as possible. Uh, if for no other reason, it, it can actually accelerate process, um, and then we can use rulemaking in the appropriate way to point to the standards. Okay. Next slide. Uh, infrastructure. We were already talking about uh, again. Thanks uh, for the uh, infrastructure. I think here where 
rulemaking is not going to be done, or if it's we're pre-decisional for rulemaking and you have the opportunity to engage, making sure that we understand where uh, our regulators are going, be it you know the FA or the FA working the EPA or whoever it may be, understanding where what you're thinking helps inform us in terms of our design of, of our aircraft um, as we as we move forward. Uh, the same thing goes with obviously structural. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know we where where we know where um, you know you can't talk to us, but we also know where you can. And so let's make sure that we appropriately uh, use that that white space, for lack of a better term. Um, okay, and we'll keep going. Okay. Uh, Community, uh, you know, this is a great one. Um, only, well, they're all great, uh, great team. Uh, but it it was clear in the document that um, there was there was not a whole lot of reference to the engagement of the community. And and if we've learned anything from the Northeast Corridor and Next Gen, the 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 engagement of the community early and making sure that they understand what it is we're doing is going to be critical for the overall success and save all of us a lot of pain later on, congressional hearings, et cetera, the noise caucus. Uh, so uh, really do want to make sure that, um, you know, that local community coordination is occurring sooner rather than later uh, in this. And uh, Salida, I'm sure you have something to say on this particular issue itself. Yeah, I would say for this one and the, the previous one on vertiports, um, you know, one of the things that was striking and a lot of the information um, coming out of, of the FAA for a while is that when the FAA used the term community, who they meant was industry. Um, and so it is definitely time to take a pivot and broaden that definition um, and include, you know, local stakeholders, folks who are owners and operators of ground transportation um, because that will be good work on that upfront will save literally years uh, on the back end. Um, and I think there's a the natural tension between industry wanting to deploy quickly, but the actual time it takes to build credibility and do uh, genuine community work. Uh, and so the FAA has a, has a role to play there in kind of holding that tension um, and making sure that things are sort of proceeding at the right run run rate. Um, and I would also say this bullet here about UAM and RAM. RAM may be something that uh, deploys sooner just because of the, uh, the, the powerful, particularly medical use cases um, in rural areas um, and emergency response cases and also um, in, those, um, in those areas as well. Uh, and maybe focusing community work there initially. Um, while we have a longer runway, mind the pun, for urban areas um, is another sort of uh, piece of food for thought um, that we think that, that the FAA could take under consideration as they are uh, sort of figuring out the right framing questions for, for this section. But this section certainly needs a lot more. There are sort of more questions here um, that have not yet been captured. And so this is the area from my perspective Obviously, I'm most passionate about it um, because I think it is critical for this industry to be able to scale, but it's also um, the, the place where there needs to be the most work done right now today. It's never too early to start. Yeah, and I also want to call attention to that last bullet there is, again, it's making sure that uh, the FAA is focused on the right questions. Um, in other words, that's the size of the market. That's not your problem. If we can't sell them, that's ours. Um, what you need to do is, uh, what you need to understand is, is how we intend to use them and how that is intended to grow over time. Um, the classic example I'll use here is um, uh, the Airbus A380 required a longer runway and also required uh, the runways to be um, structurally built up. It, you didn't go back to Airbus and ask them how many they're gonna sell Right, you came back and you said, "Okay, these are the requirements if you want to land it." Right, so um, and then it was up to the Airbus to go work with the airports to figure out which ones were going to be able to fit those aircraft into the airport structure, whether gate size, etc. Right, so make sure that you're asking the right questions, not the ones you don't want to ask, don't need to ask. 
Um, so uh, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Houston. Okay, yeah, David, uh, Salida, and, and all the, uh, the task group uh, team members, thank you so much for that great interim update. Uh, this is intern update, right? That means there's great opportunities to engage and participate uh, and really help uh, you know, bring back something that the FA will be able to uh, leverage to the maximum extent possible. Um, I, I, I'm certainly able to take, uh, we're able to take a, a couple of questions if there's something very important, Bob. May, actually, may I make a, a quick response? Uh, thank you to David and Suida and the team. Um, I think we've also within the FAA learned a great deal since we have put that initial framework together. Mm. I'm glad these are interim recommendations. Loud and clear, are we asking the necessary questions? Um, also, as we start to formulate our response to this, I think we need to, um, well, we will have to in the FAA spread this, not just across the FAA, but my colleagues in um, OST and the other modalities and start talking about intermodal issues. I think there's going to be a real need for dialogue on as you complete your final responses or your final recommendations. And we, I would like to start working on the responses, even as you have interim recommendations. Um, I think there's a lot of refinement here. Um, and Salida, our interactions with you have been gold. Uh, and one thing it really taught us, at least in the UAS Integration Office, is, um, it, and Jeffrey, to your point, uh, community engagement and, and Dr. Shin, it's way more than noise and it's not one form of government. It's the FAA, it's states, it's locals, it's tribal, it's territorial. And we need to figure out, this is a very different model. I think we're all gonna have to figure out how do we do that vertical integration across all those forms of government? Because honestly, there are, state, there are things that states and locals can do that we in the FAA with our safety mandate, you know, we're limited to certain things. And there are things you can do, and I'm pointing at my colleague, Bob Brock from Kansas. Um, you know, there are things you can do in states that we can't. And there are things you can do at local airports and port authorities and, you know, all of that that we can't do. And David, to your point, we shouldn't be asking how many you're going to sell. We should be asking what are the requirements at our level, the safety requirements. And I think helping the state locals and others, what do they need to do to prepare? Um, and I also really, really appreciate the differentiation between urban and um, regional air mobility. I must say, I still have a little bit of um, what's called proactive memory interference because REM, I've spent so many years thinking that's random access memory, <laughs> you know, but I think I'll adjust eventually. Um, so really my, my statement is we need to engage with you and your team as you're doing your final recommendations and we need to start our uh, response even before you do your final. So with that, Houston, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Jay, and uh, we'll just take one question before we uh, beat the lunch crowd, but Bob, uh, you've been waiting patiently, please. No, that's okay. And I, I appreciate Jay's perfect segue. When we talk about the Office of Airports in the state of Kansas and all the DOTs across the country, um, using just our one state as an example, there's 450 airports in Kansas. There's 80 of them. Well, back step. There's 138 that are public use. 80 of them are funded by FAA somewhat. Six of them are actually part 135 commercial airports, 139 commercial airports. When we talk about crawl, walk, run, as we talk about reaching the rural and disadvantaged areas of our country, the state, local, municipal, vertical integration that Jay talked about is so critical because when we talk about standards, there are a lot of folks making standards. And when I talk to a part 139 fully funded FAA airport, 
they're pretty flexible because they have a different funding stream than the town of 3,000 people who also want to apply those standards at a crawl, walk, run level. So a thought that we would, get, that we would encourage in our rural state, where we talk about some of those issues that we're trying to reach, 10% of the cities in our state are over 4,000 people. That's a small crowd if we think crawl, walk, run is part 139, those six airports. So we're actually, many of us have had these conversations as we reach kids and we reach new advanced air, uh, technologies. What's crawl really look like? Maybe it's not at the international airport with 300,000 people population. Maybe it's a grain elevator in a town of 2,000 people that has no air and ground risk nearby. And we give that a shot. And so that's, that's my input to FAA. Number two, as we think about the industry, Office of Airports is publishing an advisory circular with a great big list of areas that they're covering. But so are flight standards and so are a number of other folks that at the end of the day, all that trickles down to the industry and that local city of 2,000 people that may also want to vert a port or whatever the topic of the day is. So my question, and this can be tabled and I like the IOU technique, Abby, that's beautiful. My question is how do we as a country integrate our answers as a regulator to say, if, if we're all making long lists of requirements, can we integrate those early in the process instead of here's my rock in the stream and here's my rock in the stream Rather than trying to reconcile a path between, why don't we start with, hold on, some six-person conference room is going to field all of this. How do we make it consumable at the lowest level instead of the highest level? So few inputs. I know industry and I know state and local communities are working hard to get this done. I think we might be taking the challenge on upside down. Um, well, that's exactly why we want to engage you with you differently on this question. And I'm also looking at our colleague, Kathy Cahill, who's from Alaska, because I know they're much like you. It's the, the small town is the real need there. So again, reemphasizing, that's why we, we realize we need to engage differently. All right, Houston, take us to lunch. All right. So, you know, with that, uh, and I was just looking here, I think, uh, you know, David, uh, Salida, we need another member on the committee. So I'm going to nominate Bob to join. I just, I say that, I know you're busy, but but I do think those, those that's exactly the type of, uh, you know, thought leadership we need to have to make sure that what, what we bring back in the final is comprehensive. Uh, so with that, Gary, I'll turn it over to you to kind of you know, provide some instructions. Thanks, everyone. We'll look forward to a good lunch uh, very quickly and uh, then come back to resume our great discussion. Gary. Okay. Thank you, Houston. Uh, for uh, uh, the committee members uh, that didn't get their question or comment in, uh, you can send me an email or put it in the chat and we'll get it to the right person and we'll get it included in the minutes if we didn't get the, an opportunity to answer your question or comment on any of the discussions that we had.